Um, inshallah, uh, you're well. If um, we will be starting shortly, um, as usual, um, we normally do an introduction from uh, the the Quran. Uh, the verses which I've chosen for today's webinar uh, are from Surah Ashura, uh, the verse of um, or the story of Prophet Lu alayhi salam is uh, spread out across the Quran in different stories. And this is uh, one of the cases where it is mentioned. Just want to look at four verses. So we start with uh, verse 163, um, which talks about taqwa, fatakallah wa atiyun. So this is Lut. Uh, mentioning to his people to be mindful um, to Allah and to uh, obey him. Um, so, um, and obviously this has significance for us because a lot of us in our journey uh, maybe started with same-sex attraction, maybe thought the uh, answer was opposite sex attraction. Um, to find out that it was maybe more about God's centricity or what we call taqwa or having a relationship with God. Um, the verse continues, uh, And this is a often repeated verse in the Quran where the Prophet says, um, I'm not asking any favors. I'm not asking any reward for um, what I'm doing. Um, in 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 the ajri la la rabbil alamin uh that reward can only be from uh lord of the worlds lord of the realms um and it's it's interesting to see that here uh what he's inviting to people is um a deeper relationship with god um and he's not doing it for any um favor any money any kind of um uh motive and he's doing it for uh, sincerity um and he knows that he's doing it as part of god's work now the next two verses is interesting and in what we're discussing here is um we have Atatuna uh, means you are going to, or you go to, or you're approaching a zakran, men, males, plural, min al of the worlds of, of realms. The previous verse was talking about uh, Lord of the worlds. This is talking about men of the worlds. Um, and this is quite clear. So uh, you're going to men. You know, I think this is spelled out quite clearly. And what what is it? How are they going to men? Um, the next the verse continues. What uh, does ma khalaka ma And you're leaving God created for you. Min uh, azwaj from your uh, spouses, from uh, the women folk, and of course, there's another verse in the Quran which specifically states min uh, dun nisa. Uh, so people who are thinking, oh, spouses here does not have um, uh, you know, a gender, you know, um, usually zoja spouse is considered. Um, feminine, especially in this case where um, the verse which is before is talking about males. Um, but why I want to highlight here is well, a lot of uh, us gloss over when we read these verses is uh, you are leaving what God created for you. And if, if we ponder on this quite deeply, this means that for every person who uh, is alive, there is a spouse, or there is a spouse which is created for them. 
Um, and for a lot of people who find that because of same-sex attraction, because of an other issue, that no one is going to really marry them, no one is really going to accept them, and that they, they're not sure if God has a plan for them. This verse is very clear in talking to the people of same-sex attraction, people who are acting out their same-sex attraction, that if they wanted, they were already potential spouses that God created for you. So I think a lot of the times people feel that because I have SSA, I never have the potential to get married or it is it is an impossibility. And what we're seeing in these verses is uh, that's not true. Uh, and you're leaving out what your Lord has created for spouses. Uh, and then God states that because you're leaving out what was um, destined for you, what was um, a plan for you, you are transgressing uh, the, the bounds which are set. So you are, in a sense, being self-centric rather than God-centric and thinking of God leading your life. So, and I really want to, I wanted to put these verses forward because we're talking about marriage. We're talking about um, people thinking that there is no hope that uh, of finding anyone who has uh, who, who will accept you because of your SSA. So I think it's uh, quite important. So uh, we go into projects. So. We offer uh, a free consultation, that's for everyone. It's not just for Muslims, if there's uh, other people of, of faith on this call, we have we do referrals. Uh, we get re uh, referrals from a wide variety of uh, people. Um, we do our best to refer them to the right place. Uh, in terms of our main offerings, we provide support groups. These are online Zoom groups. Um, you can see the vacancies over there. We have uh, a men's circle on Wednesdays. These are all UK times, which I've given here. Um, Wednesdays at seven. Uh, there's a women's circle at 12.30 uh, on Sunday. And uh, because we had such a big demand for uh, Arabic, uh, for a men's circle, so there's a men's Arabic circle at uh, 7 p.m. on Friday, which we're starting, inshallah, um, this coming week. And there's also one-to-one -one coaching, which I offer on uh, Friday evenings, and that's uh, again at a discounted price. Uh, we are not for profit, so um, we are doing this work um, for the benefit of the people. Um, so we've uh, Similarly, with the support circles, you'll find and they're £10 per month. If it's Arabic circle, it's £5 per month. And we've done that uh, more so to allow anybody who needs access, access but people who are committed to these circles. We want people who are committed and actually working on themselves. And hence, there's the payment structure. Um, recently, we've also had uh, and ask for training, training for mosques, um, and uh, or uh, external. So we we've had external organizations um, ask us for training on how to deal with this client population. So that is also something we offer. And of course, we have absolutely free webinars, which is our commitment to the wider ummah, to educating the wider ummah to, about this issue. Um, and you find that these are recorded and they're accessible on the YouTube channel. So um, I'm really excited to have um, Alan with us. Some of you may have listened to his uh, podcast, which is number 40, on the um, Away Beyond the Rainbow podcast. Um, and uh, I, I certainly have, and you know, um, 
I know at the time he did this, which is uh, perhaps uh, maybe um, 2020, um, they, uh, he had said there were about 130 people he had spoken out to in a, in a public circle. I'm sure that number has, has gone up uh, over the years. Uh, but I think this is a special day. He's he's on, uh, it's not audio, he's on video. You can see him. I think there's a, um, a added um, vulnerability piece here. Um, and, um, you know, it's, um, it's very courageous to talk about this issue in the, in the current climate. Um, not only considering the personal barriers you may have in terms of family and friends who who know uh, you know um, breaking through that, but also perhaps uh, from a political employment kind of cases as well. Some people shy away in talking about this story. So I, I the people who are courageous and brave to uh, talk openly. Uh, are are really um, you know uh, stars? They're the north stars um, in this because they're, they're able to um, reach a place where uh, they've done their work and talk about uh, their experiences. And it is it is not an easy thing to do by by any means. Um, so um, uh, a brief introduction. Uh, Alan or Lar uh, was born in the 50s in Kansas in central USA. Um, in the early 60s with his family, he moved to Colorado where he went to the, uh, had his schooling, uh, attended uh, university in Oklahoma with a degree in English and education. He also attended the seminary in Colorado um, receiving a Master's of Divinity. He holds a CELTA certificate from Cambridge University, uh, which qualifies him to teach English as a second language. Um, he's currently married um, to his high school sweetheart, uh, who he um, married after finishing university, um, uh, marriage totaling 24 years, um, he's ad uh, adopted two children from India. Um, his daughter and son-in-law uh, have been blessed with uh, a granddaughter. Um, he currently works uh, at, in, as a public school teacher um, and has family business, uh, contracting business with his father and also oversees uh, in Ukraine uh, as an English teacher uh, and currently lives in Bosnia uh, uh, teaching English. So, just stop sharing. Uh, it's, it's lovely to have you on, Alan. Okay. Oh, oh. Um, are we getting too much feedback? Um, a little bit. Is it possible for you to use the audio of your uh, mobile? Possible. Let me see. Let me get. So, yeah, let's mute the other ones. Okay, that should be better. <laughs> yes. uh, okay, I I'm actually on two devices and I realized that it's a mess but I can't get my, my audio or my vid, video to work on my PC. It was working earlier this week, just technical difficulties. And uh, so anyway, uh, I'm on my iPad in terms of seeing me. When it comes to sharing screen, um, then I, you'll have to give me permission to share screen. And, and I've got to- Okay, let's, let's do that. Let's I have a PowerPoint and we can go ahead and get started. Yes. So you should have, you should see the share button. Should okay, I've got that. Yeah. Okay, I need, 
Let's see if I can find. Uh, I need to find. I have my PowerPoint someplace here, and I can't see where it is. Um, and look there. There we go. That's it. We want that one. Okay. Great. We can see that. Okay, that's that's great. That's where I wanted to go. <clears throat> I read that many years ago, but I think it's still pretty valid that 30% of men with SSA, same-sex attraction, are in heterosexual marriages. Uh, I'm an example of one such man who has SSA, who married a woman, and I'm here to share my story and my experiences. Oops, what did I do there? Um, don't know what I did. <clears throat> Let's lose you. There we go. Okay. Um, there we go. <clears throat> Got married in 1979. This is Beautiful. 2023, uh, 44 years together. I've been married 44 years to one woman and I've never acted out sexually with another man during those 44 years. I would say that I have a good marriage and overall I would say that we have been happy together and we've raised two wonderful story, uh, two wonderful children. Okay, there we go. So this is my story. Um, I knew I had same-sex attraction from the time I was a teenager. And the root causes were typical for men with same-sex attraction. I didn't really connect well with my father uh, as a child or as a teenager. Uh, other boys, um, as I was growing up, um, I didn't connect very well with that. Uh, I was bullied later on when I was a teenager. Uh, I remained overconnected to my mother and to the world of femininity. Um, I had some, because of these things, I had traumas that were connected to my gender and that wounded me. Um, and it wounded me in, my, in connection to my masculinity. Uh, at puberty, because I had unmet needs to, to feel accepted and to be um, part of the male community, um, those unmet needs uh, resulted in uh, basically sexual attraction. Uh, at that point, I began to uh, experience the desire to have um, a sexual uh, relationship uh, with with men, with boys. However, um, I dated women in high school and university, and um, I actually got engaged to be married to my best friend from high school. At this time, my SSA, my same-sex attractions, was all in my thoughts um, and my fantasies. Uh, it was basically just a secret thought life. It was there. Um, I experienced having crushes, they were secret uh, on different, different men that had qualities that I admired, uh, that I thought were masculine or attractive or other kinds of things, but it was never anything I acted upon. Uh, however, when I was in university, um, there was a man I knew, he was older, and um, he basically tempted me to have sex with him. And I think because of my unmet emotional needs to connect to a man, I, I wanted that. Um, and I had a sexual relationship with him for a number of months. At the end of that time, um, we ended our relationship and, and I absolutely realized that a homosexual relationship was not meeting uh, the deep emotional needs I had to connect to a man in a healthy way. 
Um, I really wanted an affirming and loving relationships, a relationship, and the sexual part didn't fulfill any of that. It didn't give that to me. So I felt I ended up feeling that the man had simply used me for his lust, uh, and I didn't feel like he really sincerely cared for me or loved me. So at that point, I decided that I could not be happy in a homosexual relationship. And I made the decision. I chose to live a heterosexual life from that time on. Um, I did want to get married and have a family. My future wife and I were best friends with a, a deep emotional connection. Uh, I had romantic feelings towards my future wife. And I felt, I think, some sexual attraction to her. But at the same time, I had a lot of unresolved issues uh, around same-sex attraction. It was interfering with my internal sense of my own masculinity. I, I didn't ever feel affirmed to my masculinity growing up. And because of that, I, I had a lot of doubts or struggles with, with accepting myself. Uh, so I struggled with these self-doubts uh, for a long time, and my fears, I had fears, a great deal of fear about sex and feeling like I could be a good sexual partner to my wife. Don't know what that is doing there. Okay. All right. Um, right. Let's see if I can get that to move. Hmm. Uh, I'm trying to move to my next slide and I'm not having very good luck here. Uh, I don't like technical difficulties. <laughs> uh, no, there's always, if you right click, if you right click, there might be an option for next slide. Um, see if let, me, that works. let me just try it this way. Um, I don't know what's going on with this. I'm not getting anything with right click, left click, and my arrow buttons are not oh, okay. giving me either. Um, let me start, try stopping my share and I'll try starting again. Yeah, yeah, try help. that. If, if okay. I'll try again. Um, there we go. Okay, back in. There we go. I hope that's it. All right. Um, good relationships bring happiness and satisfaction. Um, I get a lot of information from TED Talks and, and um, off of Facebook and other things. This was from a TED Talk. And it says, good relationships satisfy us and make us happy. Uh, loneliness kills us. People in good relationships are happier, physically healthier, and they live longer. So, uh, the topic today is married with same-sex attraction. The reality is here that some men that are listening today will not get married. That's okay. You don't have to get married, okay? Everything I'm saying about good relationships today uh, in the context of getting married is also things that you can apply towards healthy friendships with people, friendships with women, friendships with men. So don't go away if you don't think you're going to get married. <laughs> There's good information here about healthy relationships. Uh, and I want to say this, you can have a very deep, uh, satisfying and happy life without being married. Uh, my son is currently 36 and unmarried, and I think he has a happy life, and I think he's satisfied. And the reverse is true. You can be married and be very unhappy and very dissatisfied. So let's, let's start with that. <laughs> being married is not the key to being happy and satisfied. Good relationships, good relationships 
are the key. Um, I wanted to show you, if you can see in the picture here, um, I've shown, here's a couple, this is a heterosexual couple, they're in a relationship, okay? Here I've got a relationship, father and son, and here I've got a relationship between friends. <laughs> All three of the guys in this picture, including myself, uh, have same-sex attraction. So just anyway, you can see that we uh, were there and, and we are supporting each other in relationship. Okay, let's see if I can get back here. Okay. Once upon a time, blah, 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 blah. And at the end, and they lived happily ever after. Let me see if I can do that. Let's move there. Okay. Uh, this is a fairy tale. That's, that's how the way all the fairy tales uh, begin and, and how they continue. But is it real life? Uh, I just want to say that marriage is much more than simply happy feelings. Uh, when one person with same-sex attraction marries a heterosexual partner, um, it creates very unusual dynamics um, and some difficulties for the husband and the wife. But these dynamics and problems are not impossible to overcome. I remember that all marriages have problems and all husbands and wife need help from God to adjust to their new life together. Same-sex attraction is just one unique kind of problem that a few married couples might have. Other couples struggle just as much with different problems. Most men with same-sex attraction want to get married who want to get married have fears about having a sexual relationship with a woman because they often feel no sexual attraction to women. And like most fears, this is a problem that has solutions. Keep listening. Hmm. Marriage lets you annoy one special person for the rest of your life. I smiled when, when I first saw that and I thought it was well worth keeping. Um, all marriages take work. Uh, there are blessings and also challenges. There will be disagreements, conflicts, and annoyance. A good marriage is based on the commitment to work through the difficulties as well as to enjoy the good things. How can I know I'm ready for a relationship? Be the person you want to have in your life. Getting married doesn't fix same-sex attraction. A supportive wife can help that marriage by itself will not repair the issues uh, a man has with his same-sex attraction. There is work that he must do, and it is best if he does um, a lot of that work, not necessarily all of it, but it's best if he does a lot of that work before he gets married. We'll talk more about that. Um, no one is perfect. And you cannot and wait until you're perfect in, in, uh, before you <laughs> get married. Uh, it never works that way. But loving and accepting yourself before marriage will make it possible for you to love another person. Um, I really think and honestly say that I was not in the right place I needed to be in terms about accepting myself as a man, my own masculinity when I got married. Um, those are issues I've worked on since. Uh, it would have been better if I had done more of that work before I got married. I want to share with you um, a couple of uh, different texts. Now, these are not things that I wrote. These are uh, these are things that I have picked up and I'll tell you where I got them. Um, and I also wanna share with you that most of the 
most of these uh, things that I'm sharing with you during this, this presentation will be available um, as resources and strong support. Uh, you can download the documents. There's a button that's there in the documents that I'm talking about and sharing from are there. So I, I, you can read about these things, repeat what I, I'm saying now. You can also review them. Sometimes I'm kind of summarizing things and I'm not giving all the details. So please, please check out the resources that are there. Um, I attended the Richard Cohen um, PATH training in 2019 for uh, training people uh, to work with men with men and women with same-sex attraction. And this is from that training session that we had. Um, this is from a, a book by David Steele called Conscious Dating, Finding the Love of Your Life in Today's World. Here's what he says. If you're not happy with your life or yourself, a relationship will not fix it. Know who you are and know what you want. Unmet needs will break up relationships. Core needs are non-negotiable. Uh, clarify your need, your needs for a partner. So here's the relationship readiness quiz that he gives us. Number one, are you ready? Are you ready you know, for a relationship? Number one, I know what I want and I have a clear vision for my life and my relationships. Number two, I know my requirements. I have written a list of uh, at least 10 non-negotiable requirements that I use for screening potential partners. I am clear that if any are missing, a relationship will not work for me. Now, I'll just give you a quick example. Um, one requirement you might have is that the person you marry shares your faith in God. That's, that's just a non-negotiable. You wouldn't consider marrying somebody who was an atheist or an agnostic or something else. So that might be one of the requirements you have. Um, you might require um, other kinds of things that the person uh, be uh, intelligent or caring or, or other kinds of things. But anyway, those are we're thinking about. Number three, this is so critical. I am happy and successful being single. I enjoy my life, my work, my family, my friends. I'm living the life I want and I am not seeking a relationship out of desperation and need. Well, four, I am ready and available for commitment. I have no emotional or legal baggage from a previous relationship. My schedules, commitments, and lifestyle uh, allow me to be available to build a new relationship. Five, I'm satisfied with my work or my career. My work is fulfilling, supports my lifestyle, and does not interfere with my availability for a new relationship. Six, I'm healthy in mind and spirit. I am reasonably happy and feel good. Seven, my financial and legal business is handled. I'm not in debt. Uh, <laughs> I don't know other kinds of uh, legal issues. Eight, my fam family relationships are functional. My relationships with children, my ex-girlfriend, my ex-wife, my siblings, my parents, and extended family do not interfere with having the life and relationships that I want. Now, I want to stop here. Um, it seems like some of these things are just incredibly, what, uh, difficult, hard, crazy, I don't know what. Uh, this one about family relationships being functional. Um, some of us come from highly dysfunctional families. And so if that is the case, you know, we cannot change the dysfunction of a mom, of a father, a brother, or sister, things like that. We cannot change those. 
But in terms of being functional, we should be healthy in terms of our relationship towards them. We should have good boundaries in place. Uh, we should be able to say, I've forgiven the, the pain that they've caused by not holding resentments. Those are functional for us. Uh, it would be grand if you could have uh, a reconciliation with any, all those family relationships, may or may not happen. Um, you know, some of these other things. Um, it's great to be satisfied with your work or career. Um, some of us have jobs that have good points and bad points. It's, it doesn't mean that any career or job that we have is perfect, but if we go to work every single day and wish, <laughs> wish we worked someplace else, you know, that, that's a whole different kind of thing. It means that we're, we're not really getting the need for uh, emotional completion from our work that we should have. Um, you know, uh, being happy, being single, I think is terribly important before we get started, you know, thinking about a relationship with another person. Um, you should be able to say on, to some extent, to some degree that you do enjoy your life, your work and your friends, okay? Maybe your family, it depends upon who your family is. Some families are not functional as we've talked about. And you may simply have to be a little bit more protective in the family, but you should still be able to have good close relationships with people. So anyway, I want to put a little disclaimer in there. These sounds like almost impossible and ideal things. They are ideal. Uh, they're worth shooting for. They're worth thinking about. Uh, if there are areas that are glaring uh, deficiencies, they are worth working on before you actually work on getting into a relationship. Okay, number nine, this is cool. I have effective dating skills. I can initiate contact with people I want to meet and I can disengage from people who are not a match for me. I keep my physical and emotional boundaries and I balance my heart and my head when considering potential partners. So I'm not letting my, my emotions take over and let my, you know, my rational thought, you know, just throw it out because I need that if I'm going to keep boundaries and um, if I'm going to, you know, make good decisions. Ten, uh, I have effective relational relationship skills. And now this, of course, is something that you can work on. Um, counselor, therapist is working on relational skills to make them more functional, especially if you, uh, like me, I, I grew up in codependency. I learned a lot of really bad relational skills from that, but there are things that can be worked on. There are things that you can grow. I understand relationships. I can maintain closeness and intimacy. I've learned how to do that in a healthy way. I can communicate authentically and can be the real me. I can be assertive when I need to be. I can negotiate differences positively and allow myself to trust and to be vulnerable. I can give and receive love without emotional barriers. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So here's 10 relationship attitudes. This is all still part of conscious dating and this is in the resources that you can check out after the webinar is over. I strive to live and be in the present moment. I'm not obsessing about the past and I'm not worrying about the future. I love, accept, and trust myself. I'm focused on connecting, not on results. Uh, a partner is someone to love, not an object or a goal to achieve. I strive to be authentic, to be fully honest with myself and with others. Um, I try to keep my words and my actions and my values in line with uh, what I really believe. I can take necessary risks. I can overcome my fears um, and I can stretch my comfort level to reach my goals. I assume abundance. I, that means I really think that there are opportunities and resources that I need that I can I can find and that I can uh, use. Uh, I take initiative in my life and my relationships. Now there's a great deal more to this, this uh, text.
please check out the resources. This is a summary for men and women for dating and mating. First, make a list of requirements and needs. These are the requirements I have for my future spouse. Uh, these are the things I need in a relationship. Uh, things like honesty, trust, and so forth. Um, I can create a relationship vision, uh, my vision of what I want uh, an ideal relationship to look like, realizing that no, no person is going to meet that 100%. <laughs> There's no perfect people out there. Uh, but I can still have a vision of what that's going to look at. Um, I'm seeking mentoring from elders, um, opposite sex, attracted friends, and those in my spiritual community. Um, I need mentors who are both same-sex mentors, same-gender men, uh, mentors, and I need mentors who are opposite-gender mentors. There may be some questions that you will want to ask the men. There may be some questions you want to ask to women. You know. um, I need to resolve any opposite sex issues that I have. Uh, sometimes that might mean uh, I have some uh, experiences with, with women that have made me insecure, made me fearful, or uh, make me uh, withdraw or other kinds of things. They need to be resolved. You need to love yourself. You need to be ready to enjoy dating as a process. Uh, the good news is, is that all men who date women go through a process. Uh, you never end up with tiny exceptions, very tiny exceptions. You never end up with the first person that you date. Uh, that means that you'll go through dating and you'll decide that you're not meant for each other and then you'll try again with some other woman. And <clears throat> That may not work out either, and, and you just have to enjoy it as a process. You're basically trying to find someone who really meets the requirements, the vision you have for for uh, future spouse. And the only way to do that is to go out and meet people, uh, get to know them, uh, get to know them more deeply, and discover what they're about. That's how you do it. So if you expect to meet the, uh, the first person you meet and go out on a date with it, it's, it's going to end up in a uh, wedding. That's just not realistic. Consider a process. Consider that you're, you're learning. Every teenager who begins to date goes through the same process. Uh, you may be older than a teenager. You just get to do it anyway, no matter what your age is. Enjoy it. Um, <laughs> this is something he says. Uh, this is from Richard Cohen. Uh, if you're a former same-sex attracted man or a woman, he's, you're basically now emotional teenagers going through this process. So just you're growing up, have fun and enjoy the process. How about that? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> the, second, uh, the second text I want to share with you is called How to Love a Woman. And I want you to understand that I, I wrote this text for my nephew. My nephew does not have same-sex attraction. He's opposite sex attracted. But what I say here, I think applies, uh, <clears throat> I think it applies very well to both men and women. First, you must love yourself. Richard Cohen says, you cannot give what you haven't experienced. You must receive and experience healthy love. Love is a medicine that will heal your emotional wounds. You must find healthy mentors and friends who will gift you with healthy male affection and affirmation. So you cannot love a woman, another person, until you love yourself. Second, focus on being a friend. Most great love relationships start with friendships. Treat your potential girlfriend the way you want to be treated. Respect her, be kind, listen to her with your full attention. Turn off your smartphone when you're with her. Uh, surprise her with small thoughtful gifts, speak some sincere words of admiration for her. Uh, if you're not familiar with the five love languages, words of affirmation, gifts, quality time, acts of service, affection and touch, there's a book out there that you can read. Uh, have patience to let your relationship grow naturally. Don't try to rush things. In general, two people don't often grow in love 
uh, for each other at the same rate. If you find yourself growing or your feelings of love fat moving faster than your girlfriend, slow down and be patient. If you put pressure on her before she's ready, the most likely result is that you will frighten her away. Uh, ask meaningful questions to find out who she is on a deeper level. Be ready to share something vulnerable about yourself. Go slowly with her and go slowly with what you reveal to her. You need to develop trust. This takes time and shouldn't be rushed. Um, any revelation about your farmer or your current same-sex attraction shouldn't happen until you have established a closer and more intimate relationship and you're getting more serious about your future together. Revealing your past or your current same-sex attraction too soon may scare her away from developing a trusting, deep relationship. Develop healthy love in all of your relationships. Make that part, that love part of your character. This will be attractive to any woman who is interested in you. Um, healthy self-love will make you a man who loves and accepts himself and therefore can be selfless without insecurity to give his love to others. Um, so spend a little bit of time, look at your motivations. Why are you here? If it's out of neediness, it's probably not healthy love. Uh, you need to have her best interest um, as one of your goals. Uh, if you have an empty love tank and uh, you, let me define myself here, there we go. You empty love tank and you are seeking a relationship so that you can get her siphon love off of her love tank. Uh, that isn't going to work very well. That's not a healthy love. True healthy love is about giving, not about taking love. If she's healthy, she will want to give love in return. And uh, both of you will be giving love in a healthy way. Um, the purpose of your growing friendship, okay, we're talking about friendship here, is to discover who this woman is. Uh, she's not perfect, neither are you. Allow for imperfections, character faults, and mistakes. But if you discover that she's not emotionally healthy enough to return your healthy love, find another woman who is. Uh, here are a few thoughts about sexual love with a woman. First, sex is really only meant to be between a husband and wife in a lifelong marriage. This is God's intention for marriage. The modern cultural ideas that we have about sexual freedom and casual sex with multiple partner partners can be hurtful to the well being of both partners. Sex without commitment is basically selfish sex. It focuses on your pleasure and not the well being of your sexual partner. Sex without commitment uses people for private pleasure. Uh, Sex is really a glue that kind of holds a relationship together, and so it's best expressed in lifelong committed marriage. Women want the security of knowing that they are loved and cared for. Intimacy before sex is a key to a woman's sexual happiness. When she feels secure and loved, she will gladly and freely give her body sexually to her partner. A man wants sex to feel intimately connected and loved. Okay, notice that the order is different. The woman's emotional well being comes first before she enjoys sexual connection. The man's sexual connection comes before he feels the emotional connection. Uh, a good man understands this, and it's his responsibility to make sure that the woman uh, has his respect and love. Uh, every man. Same sex attracted, opposite sex attracted, wants to know that they can have good sex and satisfy their partner. Uh, <clears throat> this is true for uh, anybody. Uh, <laughs> it's just, just a human uh, expectation. Uh, prepare yourself for lifelong committed sex to one woman in a relationship. I suggest that you, before you get married, that you read a few good books about sex. Uh, this will help you understand some of the basics and the real differences between a woman and a man sexually. Women generally take much longer time to come to an orgasm than men do. This means you need to spend more time preparing the woman sexually before you become sexually active if you want to have your orgasm at approximately the same time. 
Um, I'm going to leave any further discussion of the mechanics of sex to people who have written about it. Uh, I just want to make a general comments. Um, first and foremost, it's important that you and your wife enjoy this. Your partner is your best teacher about what she, uh, she likes sexually, and you are her best teacher about what you like sexually. Talk to each other, show each other. You spend a lot of time building trust with this person, so trust them now. If you fail at good sex at first, trust them and continue to work on it until it improves. When you mess it up, and you won't get it perfect the first time, or the second, or the third time, unless you experience some sort of supernatural miracle, just laugh and talk about it. Talk about sex. Relax. You have a lifetime to learn how to please each other, to pleasure each other in this wonderful act of love. Films today make it look like two people who meet each other and fall in love, or at least fall into lust, simply go to bed and have fantastic sex the first time. This is really a very unrealistic expectation. It takes time and practice to have good sex. Pornography is a horrible sex teacher. It contains violence and rough sex. Sex should be gentle, caring, and an expression of love. Have the right expectations and work towards sex that expresses true love. Okay, I hope you enjoyed both those texts. Uh, wow, let's see if I'm still connected here. Um, if you've chosen to get married and want that to be success, be to your spouse the sort of person you need them to be to you, come what may. So this is about working on yourself first, being the kind of person. If you're happy with yourself, if you respect yourself, if, if you uh, accept yourself, you are well on the way to being the kind of person that they want you to be. Now, um, our brains are wired for connection. That's the way God made us. But trauma rewires them for prote uh, protection. Uh, and that's unfortunate. <laughs> That's why healthy relationships are difficult for wounded people. Let's see, we need to go back here. Okay. Um, we'll go there. Let's see if I can get here. All right. Um, today, I'm generally assertive, self confident, and trust my masculinity. Uh, the area of my journey into manhood that I'm focusing on this time is my relationship as a man to a woman in particular to my wife. There were a lot of dysfunctional things as well as good things in our relationship from the very beginning. Um, communication wasn't always the best. Conflict resolution wasn't the best. Um, I approached, I approached um, my relationship in a very codependent way because that's what I learned from my, my family of origin. So I'm still in the process of growth and, and I'm changing to become a better husband for my wife. Uh, so I guess you could say that the topic in some ways goes outside my comfort zone. It's a bit of a stretch for me. I did some things right and I did some things wrong. And if people can learn from me to do the good things I did and avoid the mistakes, then God be praised. Um, same-sex attraction affects all areas of life, physical, emotional, and spiritual, but it's primarily a problem with emotional development because of shame and attachment loss. Most same-sex men need support and help to restore their normal development and masculinity. They need support to connect in healthy relationships to men and also help in uh, having a healthy relationship to their wife. Um, I really wished when I was in my 20s and 30s that I'd had uh, mentors and, and supportive people. Um, I needed something like a mentor, a therapist, spiritual guide, or somebody to help me to adjust me to a good husband. Um, I didn't really have that. Um, and I'm sorry that I didn't seek somebody, but I didn't really know about that. And it was embarrassing to me. So I encourage you to get that network in place before you get married. Um, you need it for life in general, but you especially need it with marriage issues, and every married man will have some issues. Um, Likewise, wives need a good support network uh, when they marry men, whether he's opposite sex attracted or same sex attracted. They need it. Uh, here's I, some... I, 
I love that statement. Um, all men need other men and we need support. Um, we're just coming over the hour. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, I'd like to pause. Um, and I know there's a lot of material and we've had technical difficulties, uh, but what I'm gonna share, uh, if I can, let me just see if it's gonna... Um, you want me to stop my share? Um, I think I can do it. Okay, yes. So <laughs> what I'd like to show is where you can get all of this material. So if you go where you registered, you'll find the uh, download documents. And um, <clears throat> Alan's just been amazing. He's done so much more than <laughs> I I'd, I'd expected. And um, you look, we went through how to love um, a woman. We went through that. And there's so much more, uh, which is which is there. And, uh, you know, we really thank him for, for this. Uh, since we ended on the topic which was talking about support and needing um, support for men. I want to open up and make it a bit more personal um, to the Q and A section, um, if if that's possible. I know you shared uh, quite a lot in terms of um, uh, best practice uh, in in terms of relationships really and good relationships and, and yes and it's not all about marriage uh, you know um, especially in the Muslim community we find a lot of people think oh if I get married that's the answer that's the answer to the SSA and obviously um, make making good relationships takes time it takes time for any relationship uh, to reach to that level um, one of the things I noticed in, in your story, which was almost um, uh, completely a no-brainer for you, was that uh, when you, because you got married pretty young in, 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 in that sense, but you, you were honest with your wife in terms of, okay, this is where I'm at, you know, and a lot of men in our community have difficulty with that. Uh, with being honest or they they feel that I think in the podcast you said something like if it's never gonna bring up if you don't want to bring it up ever then don't talk about it but if you think that it will affect or it will you know it will be something to be to talk about then do bring it up what would be your advice to men who think they can't tell or they won't tell because of whatever, even if it's cultural um, pressure or, you know, you don't get married that way. What would, be, what would your advice be for, for those men who are uh, probably even at a very good stage of recovery uh, uh, from SSA into entering a relationship where their spouse is unaware about the work that they're doing? Okay. okay, if you're talking about a spouse and you're already married, um, I would guess I would have to gauge what your level of trust and intimacy is at the, if you're already married um, and talk about if you want to talk about that with your spouse. And also, I would suggest I, I call it like the stair steps. You, you, you start out with telling a little bit of your story, like, you know, uh, as, as a boy, I did not connect very well with my dad, and, and that caused me some problems, you know, in terms of, of I didn't feel like I was very masculine or something. You start out with, with simpler parts of the story, and you share, and then you, uh, you see how that is received. And, and I call it the stoplight theory. You know, if you get a, a red light, like shock you know and, and and it's not received well you get negative comments or things like and you're telling you're telling a kind of a simple part of the story that you can tell that's not too too vulnerable not too too dangerous if you get a red light you just stop you, you kind of back off if you get a, a yellow light you kind of proceed with caution you know moving forward if you get a green light okay then you go up 
to the next step and you tell a little bit more about your story. So basically you begin to relate your story in steps, you know, increasingly uh, leading up to a revelation that, you know, I, I, I struggled with the same sex attraction. Now that could be true for, for a person who is engaged as well as for a married person uh, or a person who simply, uh, you know, I would say if you're just dating a woman, you want to get to a, a really, you want to be moving to a pretty good place of trust and intimacy before you would begin to share those things with them. But obviously you're developing a relationship. It's not one-sided. She's sharing things with you about her life. You're sharing things with her about your life. You are learning more about each other. She's not perfect. She has traumas, problems, and her past things that she's dealing with, if she's able to share that with you and, and you can accept and trust her, then you should be able to do that. I think ideally it would be better for husband and wife in this special relationship not to have secrets before they go into marriage. I, I think particularly because of shame and uh, cultural aspect in Muslim communities, this is not always possible. And, and you would have to judge very carefully who is safe, who can I tell, you know, uh, can I tell my future wife, uh, you know, can I tell my, my best friend at the mosque, you know, I mean, you have to, to make some judgments on what you do uh, because it could have a lot of ramifications for your future. So I, there's not one answer that fits every man. Uh, where the people listening yes. to this come from Definitely. different cultures and different countries. I love what you say about the same way as you're carrying stuff, your spouse will be carrying stuff as well. We tend to forget that. So, you know, we feel that, uh, for, for example, if our spouse kept something as big as SSA from us, we would probably be quite angry, right? Because we'd be like, really? And not because... Uh, a lot of times spouses, it's not because it's an issue, it's because you didn't feel that I could help you in this, you didn't feel that I, I, I could support you in, uh, you know, so it's, it's less about the issue and more about um, valuing that person's uh, contribution or uh, the uh, place they have in your life for, for you to do that. Of course, if you're in a, a community where it's illegal to, you know, uh, to be this, then there is a lot more ramifications. But, um, you know, generally in Muslim countries, the uh, if you what's illegal is doing it in the public, you know, which I think would be illegal in most countries um, in, in that manner. So I think, um, there's a, a social stigma, a shame around just having the same sex attraction, um, which I think it, it takes a while for people to, uh, you know, to, to go in and, and have that. So, so yeah, uh, I think we're having questions uh, coming up. So I'm going to go to the question. Um, hopefully you can see that. Um, this one says, uh, thank you, dear Alan. It's a very powerful testimony and webinar. When should we say about our SSA to our future wife and how, I guess we're talking about this now, I'm afraid to scare her and that her perception of myself will change in a negative way and deteriorate the relationship. <laughs> I, I kind of think we talked about that, but like I say, um, there's a slide that I didn't show you that I would really love to show you, but it's talking, I'll just share the idea with you. It's talking about the progression of men with same-sex attraction uh, who, who, you know, are moving from, uh, you know, how they move through things. And the first area is friendship, okay? And, and that's simply becoming friends with the person, enjoying being together, uh, being able to do things together, being able to talk together and so forth. Uh, the next step is warmth. Um, the, the feelings 
become stronger, you feel like there's an attachment or a bond that's that's better than say just some of your other friends that that we may have. This is this moves from just a friendship like one of my friends to this is moving towards more like one of my best friends or even my best friends. So you, you move to warmth. The next stage is affection. And with, with affection, we're talking about actually physical touch. Or we're now beginning to hold hands or, or uh, we can walk together and I don't know what's appropriate in Muslim communities in terms of dating or whatever, but, but we're able to look deeply into each other's eyes and, and communicate care for each other, those kinds of things. So that after that is affection, then it becomes romance. Um, romance, of course, is when you're beginning to actually have these feelings like, um, this person is so special that, that this is a person I would really like to share my life with. This is a person I would like, uh, you know, to, to be able to have a family with, to be able to, you know, um, take this one person and make this a special uh, relationship for my life. And then after that uh, is sexual, um, sexual, uh, moving into a sexual thing. And that, this is a progression. Now, as you're moving, you're building trust, you're building intimacy with the person. Um, like I say, you, you start out by asking important questions to find out things, but you, you want the questions to develop and move uh, deeper and deeper. So it, it's kind of like I was saying, you, you start out by sharing little bits of your story, the parts that are not too threatening, and you just keep moving. It's like you take a step up the stairs and you just keep moving up the stairs. Um, if you're getting to a point where you really are beginning to have feelings for, for this person, like I, I think this person is extremely special, uh, that's, and you're also being authentic, you're being vulnerable with this person, she's being vulnerable with you, uh, that might be a point where you decide I'm going to, to take the risk and do this. Now, there is a risk, there's no guarantee. If you, if you share this, you may frighten her away. Uh, my son-in-law uh, revealed to my daughter before they got married that um, he had had a sexual experience with another girl. And my daughter at that point was like, <laughs> it, was, it was just like terrible shock to her. She felt terribly uh, betrayed, terribly violated. And, and her first reaction was to, to pull away and leave. <laughs> and I and my wife were advised to say, hold on, hold on, wait down, slow down, slow down. <laughs> he, he was being honest and vulnerable with you. He didn't want to keep any secrets from you. Uh, he's telling you this now because he cares about you, you know, accept that for what it is. He's a really nice guy. You've, you've grown together. Don't, don't just back off and push away now. So you could get that risky kind of reaction. It's possible. I think it's, it's somewhat worth the chance because, you know, if you, you mean if you can never tell your wife about your same sex attraction before you get married, I'm kind of suggesting that you probably don't do it after you get married. You should be fairly well resolved in terms of who you are and your masculinity. You're not feeling lust for men and other kinds of things. Probably it's better to just take that with you and <laughs> Allah knows and you know and some of your friends know, but. Maybe you don't need to tell that to everybody. I don't tell, I don't tell my story to everybody. I tell my story to people I trust, who I think love me, will care for me and accept me no matter what. So it's, I am selective who I tell and you have to make and, that own judgment. And I think also uh, what, what you're saying is we need to tell that story to ourselves first. So do I love myself? you know, or are there parts of me which I, I don't love? So, for example, <clears throat> there's the story, uh, what, what I'm reading with that question is the story which comes into my head, which is, if people really knew the reality about me, they wouldn't like me. And that this is a common story. 
where we feel that if people were to really know I have same-sex attraction, they will reject me. And, you know, the first person that we need to accept is us and say, it's okay. It's okay if I have SSA. I still have value. I still have worth. And once we're able to do that, then only we can enter into a relationship, whether it's a marriage, whether it's any type of relationship. But if we're shut off from ourselves, shut off from our own reality, uh, then of course, if we can't tell it to ourselves, we can't tell it to our our, our spouses. Um, and I love the story that what you've shared. Um, uh, of course, uh, your daughter is showing pure emotion, which would be what? Really? You know, and I think that's the emotion you would expect because you want the person to react like that for to clear the air almost that okay, I have I have been honest and I've been truthful. And it's uh, only on later reflections that you think, oh, you know, because uh, for a lot of us, you're making up appearances during the um, uh, stage where you're like, oh, I, I need to be on my best behavior. I need to send my best photos. I need to, you know, kind of be as attractive as I possibly can be. And of course, there is wisdom and there is a reason for that. Uh, but when we look at a relationship um, on a broader term, you know, things when you uh, look more um, on a long term basis, you say, OK, I need to put a good example for me to get married. But also, I need to discuss issues which I think will be potential issues for us in, in the future. You know, I mean, uh, people discuss kids, people discuss uh, so many things. And I, am, I always say you need to discuss sexual intimacy. If your partner doesn't want intimacy or they want intimacy, and that's often uh, a topic that uh, a lot of religious people shy away from because I, I can't talk about sex. Well, you know, you're getting married. So one of the <laughs> topics which is going to come about is intimacy. And especially if both of you are um, new and you don't know, you, you want to make sure that you are uh, meeting the person's expectations. I mean, there's always a, ge a generic um, there's always a generalization that it's the men who want uh, the, you know, sexual uh, relationship, but that's not actually true. Women also want a sexual relationship. They also want to be desired and to feel that they're needed. And uh, men with SSA cannot do that organically. They have to learn to say, oh, look, you're learning beautiful, honey, you know, or uh, or that looks good on you, and I really love you, I really love how you look, because it isn't coming naturally to us, so we have to be aware of um, of these things, um, you know, in, in terms of the, the relationship. Um, how in your, um, I know in your story, one of the things you said was um, having the community, the affirmation from other men, having that sense of belonging, that anchoring with other men uh, that you wish you maybe had at the start of the marriage. So uh, I'm, I'm just curious, was that because you would have then felt more comfortable in your own skin as a man to say, you know, I'm, I'm not this weird little, you know, like person who has SSA or I'm, uh, you know, <coughs> community of men who share experiences just like me and, and then it becomes less isolating otherwise it's like oh everybody else is heterosexual and I'm the only one in this mixed orientation marriage and I think you quoted statistics where they're not you know mixed orientation marriages don't work and then there's the um, uh, weight that you're carrying maybe from that from those um, um, beliefs <laughs> that's an interesting question you know I, I have to say i'm a whole bunch older than you are <laughs> of course so first of all you know uh, I, I i had these feelings long before anything like a quote-unquote gay identity 
ever existed. I never identified myself as homosexual or gay. Uh, I wouldn't have known to say that I had the same sex attraction. I mean, the, the, the feelings were there, all the language to talk about, all the stuff wasn't there. Um, at the point where I felt very disappointed after I'd had a one relationship with one man, I basically just made a decision that is never going to satisfy me. And I don't, I don't think most homosexual relationships are satisfying. I think you've got two needy people trying to fill their love tanks off of somebody else who's got a, an empty love tank. Um, I, I struggled um, in the early years of my marriage because I, I think I didn't feel masculine. Um, and, and I just doubted that, I mean, honestly, I really enjoyed sex, but I doubted myself. And because of that, there was fear and tension and things that, that were there. So if you can imagine, you've got the bed that's there, take some suitcases and fill them full of junk and, and throw them on top of the bed. Okay, and, and, and to me, that was the baggage I was carrying around because I was not accepting myself. So now you're trying to have sex and enjoy it, but you've got these suitcases on the bed that make it really awkward. Well, I, I need, if I'd even had men I could talk to about, about sex, if I had been able to go to a counselor or, or you know, therapist, uh, anything, I think it would have helped me a great deal from the beginning. So I, I'm kind of encouraging people, get the help. If you need it, it's better to get the help than to, to go on frustrated and, and feel dissatisfied with what's going on. Um, I don't know. Uh, I made the decision not to associate with homosexual men. And so my friends that I saw it at from that point on were basically from my faith community. They were all heterosexual men. And I, I think that built a lot into my life in terms of I, I needed to be able to be friends with just normal men who were living normal lives. They all have problems. I have problems, you know, just financial problems, you know, uh, problems with sometimes with their wives, problems with the kids, you know, problems with, you know, my truck is broken down again, problems with work. I mean, Normal men have normal problems. They get together and they talk to each other about life. And, and that's very valuable, you know, for, for going forward. Um, I reconciled with my dad and later on in life with my brother, um, who I didn't, I wasn't close to um, growing up. Um, I would actually say that uh, I was the one who initiated that. Uh, you know, that I wanted to be closer to my dad. I started showing him affection. I started telling him I loved him. And he responded well with that. That's not something he had had. So because he didn't have it, he wasn't able to give it to me. When I gave it to him, here's the kid with same-sex attraction, you know. <laughs> I'm now healing my dad, okay? Amazing stuff going on. But uh, I became a friend with my dad as an adult. And, and that was a healing thing for my life. So... Many of the things that, that uh, men here need to do are to begin to have relationships, not just with, with other men who have same-sex attraction. That's kind of easy because we understand each other, but to reach out a little bit beyond the comfort zone, begin to have friends who are uh, opposite sex attracted uh, men. Um, some of them you may tell your story to, some of them you may just be friends with and you may never tell your story to but that's an important part of your healing uh, where you can fix dysfunctional relationships. I encourage you to, to work on that. It's not always possible. And I understand that, that, that gives me great sorrow. Um, you can only change yourself. You cannot change somebody else. If, if somebody else is willing, you know, to, to make some changes or whatever, sometimes you can, you can put a relationship. It can at least grow closer than it was. Uh, if you've got people who are willing to work on it, so. And uh, what you also mentioned uh, was um, for people who can't have a marriage uh, about creating good relationships, and it goes to your point about um, relationships with uh, their father, their same-sex parent, their same-sex peers, and how actually 
those are the areas to work on because that's where the wounds are or that's where uh, we're finding difficulty. Um, and in essence, almost that the work is to do, uh, you know, uh, with relationships work that we have detached from the same sex, the same sex relationships for whatever reason. Um, and the work is not fixing that with an opposite, opposite sex relationship, but revisiting that with uh, our um, beliefs and judgments on which keep us away from having really deep, meaningful uh, same sex relationships with, with people um, and how that is more of work rather than um, I'm married, you know, and I think um, so I really like what you said about um, working on relationships wherever you are in the journey where you're very new to it or you're, um, you know, uh, 44 years of marriage and you're still thinking of relationships and, and, that, and that dynamic. Um, so, so, yes. Um, um, what um, I know that you've done a lot of work um, of yourself and you love writing. And I know you, um, as, as you've done with the PDFs, you, 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 you've written a lot, a lot of things. Um, how in your uh, work with SSA and relationships or aha moments for you in your work what were maybe the top aha moments that came in your work? Because uh, I know your story uh, is on the podcast uh, and there's a lot of moments in there where you're saying, oh, this is where, but when looking back at it today, um, what were some of the aha moments for you uh, in, in, in doing this work uh, and differentiating with something which you just said, you didn't even know how to verbalize. I didn't even know how to say this was SSA. Yeah, good, good questions. Um, body shame was a, a big thing for me. Um, and <laughs> I, I, I lost my body shame one day in January, 2014. <laughs> I, I simply looked in the mirror and, and I suddenly realized you're fully masculine, you have a male body, there's nothing wrong with your body. And, and from that point on, I didn't feel ashamed of my body anymore, but I'd had body shame for more than 50 years. Uh, that, was, that was maybe a remarkable and very fast fix. Most things that you work on are, are not that fast. Um, you know, you cannot heal alone in this journey with same-sex attraction. You have to heal in community uh, you need to have safe people to, to heal with. You need to have people who can give you healthy platonic love. And that, that includes healthy uh, platonic affection. Um, it, you, you just need those things. They're, they were unmet needs when you were growing up. So um, you, you basically the starting point is, is to begin to develop those relationships. Uh, Richard Cohen says, and I agree with this, uh, you have to uh, be comfortable being a man among men before you are ready to be a man uh, with a woman. And so basically, uh, you should be doing well in your, your uh, building co uh, community and network of support partners, support friends, before you even consider. Uh, I'm not saying don't be friends with women now, but before you are getting interested in like a possible future uh, wife kind of situation, you should already be pretty comfortable with being who you are yourself. I accept myself as I am. I'm a, I'm a good man. I have problems. I can work on the problems, but I am a good man. I have strengths. I have weaknesses. Uh, and I accept both. They're, they're part of me. Uh, you need to like yourself. You need to be in a group of men who accept you. Um, it's great if those men know your story and accept you. Um, you can share that with safe man. You can't share it with everybody, but that it's wonderful and affirming when you when you can. 
be authentic with the people that uh, you care about. Lovely, lovely said. Uh, we have another question, a uh, similar line. Does marriage or having sex with a woman in general replace the lust towards men? <laughs> uh, that's a funny, funny thing. I, I think you need to do what you need to do in recovery to, to end the same sex lust, okay? Definitely no fantasy, no pornography. Uh, you actually have to, I think, deal just with the fact of walking down the street, seeing an attractive man, and then going into the fantasy mode. I mean, you should be making progress with uh, that stuff should be pretty well under control before you, before you would consider getting together with women. Um, I, I heard or saw the most interesting, um, I don't know, probably video, um, and same-sex lust is not anything like uh, heterosexual love, okay? Um, the same-sex lust is this like big burst of adrenaline and, and this, this sudden, very intense feeling, and it comes very quickly, and then very quickly it's over, okay? Um, with, with, when you're making love with a woman, it, it's something that's uh, it's like a slow burn, okay? Uh, you throw a log on the fire and it burns and burns and burns and it, it gives heat in the room and it, and it lasts a very long time. Where, whereas the same sex lust is kind of like you start a sparkler, you know, uh, uh, I, you know, fireworks when you, you light this thing and it's got the sparkles and it goes down stick and, you know, it's pretty cool while it's happening, but golly, it's over in 35 seconds. <laughs> You know, so um, some some men are are freaked out because they expect they expect love for a woman, sex with a woman to be this intense thing like it was with with same sex, uh, you know, with a man, and it's not. It's it's just very different. But see, the, there's this long lasting emotional uh, joy that comes. From, from the sex with a woman. There's a connecting of, you know, it's much more than just connecting your bodies, connecting your souls. There, there's an emotional and soul connection, spiritual connection that is there with it, physical, emotional, and spiritual. And I would say, unfortunately, with, with two, two homosexual men, most of the time, it's it generally, the sexual thing is pretty much physical. Um, some homosexual men have romantic feelings and generally they're not as interested in the sexual part. They're more interested in, they want the emotional connection, but that's, that's a different kind of thing um, for them. So, And, and I think uh, our society makes us feel as if sexual identities are binary or we're on a, you know, we're on a, a like moving spectrum. But the reality is we can have multiple desires, multiple attractions. And it's not like, oh, if I if I have same sex attraction, I can't have opposite sex attraction. We always see these as, um, you know, like um, these identities, which we've created straight, gay, or even bisexual, even with bisexual, they still ask you, where are you along, along the spectrum? And people don't cannot see that each desire is on its own and it doesn't need that just because I, you know, one of my desires has uh, increased or increased, but the other necessarily is going to increase and decrease and seeing them as separate rather than saying, oh, if one goes down, then the other goes up. And, you know, a lot of people uh, say they feel asexual when they do this work because suddenly it's like oh the lust which was over clouding it was a gray cloud over everything that's no longer there so I'm not feeling any energy and that's actually a healthy place because then you're seeing things from a, a less charged perspective so so yes uh, there's another question which says um, is sexual sobriety important in process of recovery and growth? 
I think the person who asked that knows the answer already. Yes, it is. <laughs> uh, I think it's very important uh, that you have sexual sobriety, but let me, let me go a little bit further. A lot of people are talking about physical sexual sobriety when they, they say this, you know, I haven't looked at porn for, you know, X number of years or, or whatever. And I think the emotional uh, sobriety, uh, the, the physical sobriety from, from whatever it is acting out that you do, makes it possible to develop and work on the emotional sobriety that you need, which is changing the attitudes in your mind and, and changing, you know, uh, unhealthy, unhealthy sexual patterns. I'm using sex to medicate my bad feelings, which is what most people uh, do with a, an addictive kind of behavior. Uh, but it is the emotional sobriety that then makes the long-term physical sobriety possible. If you don't work on the emotional part, you know, changing the emotional, uh, become emotionally stable and find healthy ways when you are challenged, stressed, um, lonely, sad, angry. If you don't find healthy ways to deal with those emotions, you will default back to your addictive behavior. So the emotional sobriety is all about making changes uh, that will enable you to find healthy ways to deal with it. And then you don't have to worry about the physical, uh, you know, the physical part of this physical sobriety, you know, which is acting out in some way, some behavior that you don't want to act out in. Beautiful, making the distinction between the emotional need behind the uh, sexual pull. Um, thanks a lot for this. How realistic is, is it for someone to be happy if they decide not to get married, is it too lonely when you are older and people may be too busy with their families? <laughs> I think, uh, again, happiness is, is a, uh, a state of mind that you create. Um, I think it is very possible to be uh, single and happy, but again, it has to do with relationships. They do not have to be a marriage relationship. Uh, I think you do need to have good friends. Uh, if you have a family that you can relate to in a good way, uh, you can you can do that. I'm very close to my sister. And, you know, that relationship is very important to me and my family. Uh, my mother, my father, my brother are all dead. They're, they're all deceased now. My sister's the only one left. So we're close. Uh, but you can do that. I have a son who's 36. Uh, he's not married, and I would guess at this point, looking at, at his life, he's not. There's not a big likelihood that he's going to get married anytime soon. And I would say he's a happy individual. He has relationships with people that he enjoys, uh, and it, it has a lot more to do with with liking yourself, uh, finding things that you enjoy, and being in, in good relationships. Uh, not everybody gets married, and there are a lot of happy people out there who are single. Uh, marriage is not the cure to loneliness or, you know, uh, whatever. Uh, if you get married, your wife cannot meet all of your needs. You still need friends. And if you're a guy, you need guy friends. You know, uh, it's, it's not just, well, I'm, I'm married now. The only person I can see or have a relationship with is my wife. That's, that's garbage. You, you need men in your life. You still do. So anyway, if you've got those deep and, and close connections, authentic relationships in your life, there's nothing to keep you from being happy and being single. Uh, if my wife dies tomorrow, I, you know, would I, would I suddenly become sad and depressed and horror, you know, my life all apart? No, uh, I like my life. I like myself. I have connections. I have friends, you know, there are, there are reasons why, you know, people, you know, people become single or stay single or other kinds of things. So you can be happy. You can be content um, being single. And I, and I really like how you are framing uh, the same sex attraction as a relational issue, you know, so we're talking about relationships and it's not 
uh, you know, um, marriage. I think we we often think uh, very simplistically. We think, okay, uh, problem, solution. You know, but what we're what we're not kind of looking deeply is okay. What is SSA? And SSA is a relational issue. Who is it with? Well, is it uh, the opposite sex or the same sex? Well, it's mostly a relational issue with the same sex for a lot of for a lot of people. Um, and finding ways where um, you're working on those uh, wounds, working on those difficulties. Um, and, uh, you know, you said in your aha moment, it was realizing, oh, I can't do this alone. As, as, as much as I have shame about having BSSA, I need to realize that, um, living in my head for the next x years as i've done in the past is, is no longer an option and i need i i need the support and i need to um be vulnerable and um put myself out and 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 get the support because uh it's uh you know i, I always say one of the good things that's come out of sexual identity politics everywhere is that it's put it on the map so people know now know oh yeah people have same-sex attraction <laughs> you know it's put it on the map so it's no longer something which people say oh i can't talk about my sexuality or i can't talk about these things and um <clears throat> and then there's there's a huge uh misnomer that this work we would is repressive or we are um, you know, we're denying this reality. If anything, um, we're encouraging people to come up, in a sense, to come out and say, yes, I have it. I have a different narrative, perhaps, than the popular narrative, but I I still have the same attraction as people do. Um, just because I have a different narrative doesn't mean that uh, I, I'm experiencing something different and i think it's beautiful uh, you know even in this work how um uh, whether we're from different faiths we have the same human experience and we're sharing that human experience um and um, there's a whole host of um repression whether it's coming from religion whether it's coming from society whether it's coming from an external force which is saying Oh, don't talk about this topic or you know hush 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 we can't talk about this um and having people like yourself who are brave and coming forward and saying well this is my story this is my struggle uh and um the need to have language you know uh one of the things i always remember is um the need for touch is so important because before we learned how to speak, we we had touch. You know, when we're babies, we have the, the feeling of touch. So for me to get support, I need to use words. But how can I use words if I'm deprived of touch? You know, because touch isn't, it's, you can't really explain it because it's, uh, it doesn't need speech. You know, it's something, it's a need which doesn't require speech. So it becomes harder um because a lot of people come up and they say why didn't you tell people when you were younger and a lot of us couldn't put into words what we were feeling or we could not <laughs> articulate at the time for us to get support you need to articulate it first and for a lot of us we can't articulate it to ourselves <laughs> let alone somebody else of, of, of what's happening and it's um so for for when you reach I always tell people when they've reached and they have that first call and you tell someone you have SSA and you've done that, you've actually done a lot of the work to get to that point where you can understand the SSA, be able to verbalize it, be able to get help. But whenever you do that, you always think, why didn't I do it earlier? Why, why was it that I couldn't? But the reality is you have to go through a lot of steps for you to reach reach that stage as 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 you were describing in your story. Um, 
I want to thank you so much, Alan, for your for your time, uh, your vulnerability, uh, your continued work in the fantastic resources. I know we couldn't get through all of the presentation. I know there's um, uh, material out there. Um, how, if people would like to connect with you or support you, how would you like that to happen? Would you like them to contact through me? You like uh, would that would that be helpful? Yeah, I think I think that's fine. Uh, if they want to get in contact with with me, uh, they can just write to you and you can send it on. Um, one of the things I, I realize now that I'm <laughs> in my 60s is uh, I have a lot of experience. I, I've uh, read a lot of books about same-sex attraction, attended a lot of conferences and things like that. Uh, I think I've got resources and, and things and experience that I can help younger people and uh, people younger and all, all ages younger than me. And I, I really wish I'd had somebody like that there for me when I needed it. And so I, I think part of what God wants me to do now is, is to be there for other people. So that'll, that'll work. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I, I'm grateful for you, for uh, organizations, for this road, Joel 225, which does great work with the Christian community for these organizations to exist so we can have um, uh, our narrative, our space, our safe space in this. Um, and, uh, um, you know, having these conversations, which are, are, are so important. So uh, I, I bless uh, the remaining years of, of marriage. I, I hope they're uh, they continue to be fruitful, and um, you know, uh, I I think it's amazing that you know you in your own journey you've reached the place where uh, you've done so much of the work, and now you're um, publicizing that you're putting out there, uh, and it uh, you know it, it's it's really sincere. And there's a lot of sincerity in that in terms of your work and um, the support that you're offering to so many people, uh, whether it's just um, the, the support networks, the staffing, uh, the different ways that you're doing that. Um, and, and, and yeah, uh, thank you so much for, for today, taking out your time and God bless. All right, God bless you too.